Hi everyone, it's Professor Pimpton. In this video, we'll talk about inverse trigonometric functions and their graphs. So recall that the inverse of a function f of x is the function f inverse of x, and it reverses the rule of the function f of x. So in addition, for the function to have an inverse function, it also must be a one-to-one -one function. So since trigonometric functions are not one-to-one -one functions, they don't pass the horizontal line test, the functions do not have inverse functions on their entire domain, which means that we're going to have to restrict the domain of the trigonometric functions in such a way that the resulting functions are one-to-one, -one, and they'll actually have an inverse function. So in this video, we're going to talk about how to understand and use the inverse sine and inverse cosine functions, how to find the exact value of expressions involving the inverse trigonometric functions, and how to graph the inverse sine and inverse cosine functions. So let's talk about the inverse sine function. We're going to begin with the sine function and then restrict the domain to the closed interval from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, including the endpoints. The reason for this choice of having the domain be from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 rather than all real numbers is that the restricted sine function is now a one-to-one -one function on this interval, and it actually attains every output value on this interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And so this is the graph of the sine function, y equals sine of x. Notice that the domain is the set of all real numbers from negative infinity to infinity, and the range is from negative 1 to 1, including the endpoints y equals negative 1 and y equals positive 1. However, notice that this function is not a 1 to 1 function. It does not pass a horizontal line test. Any horizontal line that we draw on this graph will intersect the graph of y equals sine of x an infinite number of times. So we need to restrict the domain of the sine function to be from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, including the endpoints. And the reason for this is because between x equals negative pi over 2 and x equals positive pi over 2, the entire sine function obtains every single output value between y equals negative 1 and y equals positive 1. So if you focus on the graph of y equals sine of x for the domain from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, including the endpoints, and the range is also still from negative 1 to 1, including the endpoints, this is called the restricted sine function. So the graph is from negative pi over 2, comma negative 1. It increases through the origin, 0, comma 0, and then it stops at the point pi over 2 comma 1. This is the entire function y equals sine of x on this restricted domain. It does actually pass the horizontal line test, so the sine function on this restricted domain will actually have an inverse function. So now that we know that we actually can find the inverse function, we're going to define the inverse sine function on this restricted domain of the sine function. So if y equals sine of x, that's called the restricted sine function, the domain is from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, including the endpoints, and the range is from negative 1 to 1, including the endpoints. If you reflect the graph across the line, y equals x, then you get this graph that's in blue, and this is called the inverse sine function. It's y equals inverse sine of x. Notice that the x values go between x equals negative 1 and x equals positive 1, and the y values actually go between negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. And this is because, recall that the domain of y equals f of x is the range of the inverse function, and the range of the original function is the domain of the inverse function. So the domain of the restricted sine function, negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, including the endpoints, is the range of the inverse sine function, and the range of the restricted sine function from negative 1 to 1, including the endpoints, is actually the domain of the inverse sine function. And so this function, y equals sine inverse of x, or sometimes referred to as arc sine of x, this is called the inverse sine function. And this is what the graph of the inverse sine function looks like. So again, the graph of y equals inverse sine of x is actually obtained by reflecting the graph of y equals sine of x on the restricted domain, x values between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, across the line y equals x. So y equals inverse sine of x is the number in the interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 whose value of the sine function is the value x. So the definition of the inverse sine function. The inverse sine function is the function represented as sin negative 1, so the negative 1 is a superscript on the sine, with a domain from negative 1 to 1, including the endpoints, and the range is from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, including the endpoints. And it's defined by y equals inverse sine of x, if and only if sine of y is equal to x. So it's the value of y. If you take the sine function of that value of y, you get x. The inverse sine function is also called the arc sine function, and it's denoted y equals arc sine of x, if you want to avoid using the inverse function notation. So in fact, from the general properties of inverse functions, we have the following cancellation properties involving the sine function. If you have composition of a function and its inverse, remember that the inverse function will undo the original function, and vice versa. So if you have sine of sine inverse of x, they'll cancel each other out and you just get x for all x values between negative 1 and 1, including the endpoints which was the domain of the inverse sine function, which was the inside function. Now, on the other hand, inverse sine of sine of x is also equal to x because the inverse sine and sine are inverses of one another, 
And so this is true for all x values between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, including the endpoints. And this was the domain of the restricted sine function, which was the inside function of the composition. So whenever you're evaluating trigonometric expressions involving the inverse sine function, you need to keep in mind that the range is the domain of the restricted sine function, because the domain of the original function f of x is the range of the inverse function f inverse of x, and the range of f of x, the original function, is the domain of the inverse function f inverse of x. So let's take a look at example one. Example one, evaluating the inverse sine function. Find the exact value of the following trigonometric expressions. Number one, inverse sine of one half. So let's call y this expression sine inverse of one half. That means if y is between negative pi over two and positive pi over two, including the endpoints, we're gonna find out what is the y value where sine of y is equal to one half. Well, keep in mind, the sine function is defined from negative pi over two to positive pi over two. That's quadrants one or quadrant four. However, the sine function was actually equal to positive one half. The sine function is positive in quadrant one. So y equals inverse sine of one half would be the angle pi over six. That's in quadrant one, where the sine of pi over six is equal to positive one half. Number two, inverse sine of the opposite of square root two divided by two. So again, let's call that value y. y is equal to the inverse sine of negative square root two divided by two. Well, this y value must be between negative pi over two and pi over two, including the endpoints, where we need to find out where is sine of y negative square root two divided by two. Well, the y value must be again in quadrants one or four for the inverse sine function to exist. And we wanna find out where is the y value negative square root two divided by two. If the y value is negative, that means we must be in quadrant four. And so that means y is equal to the inverse sine of negative square root two over two. It must be the angle angle negative pi over four because that angle is in quadrant four and that's where the sine function is equal to negative square root two divided by two. So number three, let's find out the value of inverse sine of three halves or 1.5. So again, let's call y equals inverse sine of three over two. However, this value is undefined because if the input value is three halves, it must be in the domain of the inverse sine function. Well, the inverse sine function's domain is from negative one to one, including the endpoints. 1 1.5 or three halves is not in the domain of the inverse sine function, and so this value is undefined. So example two, evaluating expressions with the inverse sine function. Find the exact value of each of the following composite functions. Number one, inverse sine of sine of pi divided by three. So keep in mind, you can only have cancellation of a function and its inverse function, provided that pi over three is actually in the domain of the inside function, which in this case would be the sine function. Well, since pi over three is actually in the domain of the sine function, y equals sine of x, and the values are between negative pi over two and positive pi over two, which is quadrants one and four, this angle pi over three is actually in quadrant one. And so it's actually in the domain of the function y equals sine of x, and so these do cancel out inverse sine and sine, and so you just get pi over three as an output value. So inverse sine of sine of pi over three is equal to pi over three. Number two, let's find out the value of inverse sine of sine of two pi divided by three. So now notice this time that x equals two pi over three is not actually in the domain of y equals sine of x, the sine function, because the inverse sine function only exists on the restricted domain for the sine function between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. Well, two pi over three is actually outside the domain from negative pi over two to pi over two for the restricted sine function. So in other words, we need to find an x value, find out an angle that actually is in the domain between negative pi over two and pi over two, where the sine of two pi over three is actually equal to sine of x. So sine of two pi over three is actually going to give you a positive value, and the sine is actually positive in quadrant two. So two pi over three, let's find out what is an equivalent angle that's actually in quadrants one or four, where you actually have the same output value as sine of two pi over three. Well, sine of two pi over three will actually be the same value if it's actually in quadrant one. So let's find out an angle in quadrant one that actually will have the same output value. Well, it turns out that it's actually equal to pi over three. So sine of two pi over three is the same value as sine of pi over three. Now, the reason why we're making this replacement is because pi over three is actually between negative pi over two and pi over two for the restricted sine function. And so inverse sine of sine of pi over three, we just did, that's equal to pi over three. So inverse sine of sine of two pi over three is equal to pi over three not two pi over three, because two pi over three is not actually in the domain for the restricted sine function. So now that we talked about the inverse sine function, let's talk about the inverse cosine function. If the domain of the cosine function is restricted to the interval zero to pi, including the endpoints, the resulting function is actually a one-to-one -one function, and it does pass a horizontal line test, and so there will be an inverse cosine function. We choose this interval 
since on it the restricted cosine function actually obtains each of its output values exactly once and it becomes a one-to-one -one function and the inverse cosine function will exist. So let's look at the graph of y equals cosine of x. y equals cosine of x, the domain, is the set of all real numbers. Well, this graph does not pass the horizontal line test. Any y value that we choose will have more than one x value, so it's not one-to-one. -one. So the inverse function doesn't exist. However, if we restrict the cosine function to a certain domain, we'll actually have an inverse function. Let's restrict the domain between x equals zero and x equals pi. Notice between x equals zero and x equals pi, the cosine function actually obtains every output value exactly once. So between x equals zero and x equals pi, we will have what's called the restricted cosine function. So y equals cosine of x on the domain, zero to pi, including the endpoints. The range is from negative one to one, including the endpoints. And so the restricted cosine function actually goes from the point zero comma one, it will fall to the point pi comma negative one, and actually attains every single output value exactly once on this restricted domain. And so the restricted cosine function will now be a one-to-one -one function. It does pass the horizontal line test. And so the inverse cosine function does exist now. So we're going to define the inverse cosine function on this restricted domain. So the graph of y equals inverse cosine of x is obtained by reflecting the graph of y equals cosine of x on the restricted domain from x values between zero and pi, including the endpoints, about the line y equals x. So the graph that we have that's in red or pink is y equals cosine of x on the restricted domain from zero to pi. It actually obtains every output value exactly once on this restricted domain. The y values range between y equals negative one and y equals positive one on this domain zero to pi, including the endpoints. And so if we take this graph of y equals cosine of x, this restricted domain, and we reflect it across the line y equals x, we get the inverse cosine function, which is the one that's in blue. So y equals inverse cosine of x will actually have a domain between negative one and one, and the range is from zero to pi, including the endpoints. So again, the reason why this is true is because the domain of the function y equals f of x is the range of the inverse function, and the range of the original function y equals f of x is the domain of the inverse function. So if the domain of the restricted cosine function is zero to pi, that is now the range of the inverse cosine function. And if the range of the original function, y equals cosine of x, is from negative one to one, then that becomes the domain of the inverse cosine function, including the endpoints negative one to one. So the definition of the inverse cosine function. The inverse cosine function is the function that's represented as cosine inverse with a domain from negative one to one, including the endpoints, and the range is from zero to pi, including the endpoints. It's defined as y equals cosine inverse of x, and it's defined this way if and only if cosine of y is equal to x. The inverse cosine function is sometimes called the arc cosine function, and it's denoted y equals arc cosine of x. So in fact, from the general properties of inverse functions, we have the following cancellation properties involving the cosine function. Cosine of the inverse cosine of x, the cosine and the inverse cosine function will undo each other or cancel each other out, and you'll just get x provided that x is in the domain of the inverse cosine function, which is the inside function. So x must be between negative one and one for this cancellation property to be true, and you just get x as an output value. On the other hand, if you have cosine inverse on the outside and cosine of x on the inside function, the inverse function and the original function will undo each other, and you'll just get x back, provided that x is in the domain of the inside function, y equals cosine of x. So the domain of the restricted cosine function is zero to pi, including the endpoints. Example three, evaluating the inverse cosine function. Find the exact value of the following trigonometric expressions. Number one, inverse cosine of square root three divided by two. So again, let's let y be the inverse cosine of square root three divided by two, and the y value must be between zero and pi, because that's the domain of the restricted cosine function. It must be between zero and pi, including the endpoints. And so we're trying to find what is the value of y between zero and pi, where cosine is square root three divided by two. So if we're between zero and pi, that's quadrants one or two. And since cosine of y must be positive square root three divided by two, it must be a positive value, we're in quadrant one. And so y equals inverse cosine of square root three divided by two, the angle where cosine is square root three divided by two, it must be pi over six. So inverse cosine of square root three divided by two is pi over six radians. Number two, let's find out the value of inverse cosine of zero. So let y equals cosine inverse of zero, and we're trying to find out what is the y value between zero and pi again, including the endpoints, where cosine of y is equal to zero. So again, the y value must be between zero and pi. That means we're in quadrants one or two. So if cosine of y is equal to zero, that only occurs whenever y is equal to pi over two which is between quadrants one and two. So y is equal to inverse cosine of zero 
the value must be pi over 2 because cosine of pi over 2 is equal to 0. And then number 3, let's find out the value of inverse cosine of negative 1 half. So again, let's let y equal inverse cosine of negative 1 half. The y value must be between 0 and pi, including the endpoints, because we must have the restricted cosine function between 0 and pi for the domain. We're trying to find out what is y so that cosine of y is equal to negative 1 half. Well, the y value is between 0 and pi, including the endpoints. So again, we're in quadrants 1 or 2, but the cosine function is a negative value. So that must mean that we're in quadrant 2 this time. So we're trying to find out what is the value of y where cosine is negative 1 half. Well, cosine is negative 1 half at the value of 2 pi over 3. And that's between 0 and pi, and it's in quadrant 2. So y equals inverse cosine of negative 1 half. It must equal 2 pi divided by 3. So again, recall that evaluating trigonometric expressions involving the inverse cosine function, we'll need to actually remember that the range is the domain of the restricted cosine function. So the domain of f of x, which will be y equals cosine of x, the domain of that restricted cosine function is the range of the inverse cosine function, and the range of the restricted cosine function is the domain of the inverse cosine function, or arc cosine of x. So the domain of y equals cosine of x is between 0 and pi, including the endpoints. That's the restricted cosine function's domain. That is the range of the inverse cosine function. So the range of y equals inverse cosine of x is between 0 and pi, including the endpoints. The range of y equals cosine of x, the restricted cosine function, was the y values between negative 1 and 1, including the endpoints. Well, that becomes the domain of the inverse cosine function, or y equals arc cosine of x. So let's finish up this video with example four. Example four, evaluating expressions with inverse cosine. Find the exact value of each of the following composite functions. Number one, let's find out the value of inverse cosine of cosine of two pi divided by three. So again, two pi over three is actually in quadrant two, and the inverse cosine function only exists if the cosine function is defined between zero and pi. And so two pi over three is between zero and pi radians. And so inverse cosine and cosine will just cancel each other out and you just get two pi over three because x equals two pi divided by three is in the domain of y equals cosine of x, the restricted cosine function, where x must be between zero and pi, including the endpoints, which means it's quadrants one or two. So two pi over three was indeed in quadrant two. And so this just becomes two pi over three. The inverse function and the original function just undo each other or cancel each other out. And then number two, Let's find out the value of inverse cosine of cosine of 5 pi divided by 3. So again, this time 5 pi over 3 is not actually in quadrants 1 or 2. So that means that x equals 5 pi over 3 is not in the domain of the restricted cosine function where the x values must be between 0 and pi, including the endpoints. So we need to find an x value in the domain between 0 and pi where cosine of 5 pi over 3 is equal to cosine of x. Well, 5 pi over 3 is actually in quadrant 4. Well, the cosine function is positive in quadrant 4. So we can find an equivalent angle in quadrant 1 that will give us the same value for cosine as cosine of 5 pi over 3. Well, that angle is pi over 3 because pi over 3 is in quadrant 1, which means it's between 0 and pi for the domain of the restricted cosine function. So inverse cosine of cosine of 5 pi over 3 which is the same value as inverse cosine of cosine of pi over 3. And since pi over 3 is actually in the domain of the restricted cosine function between 0 and pi, including the endpoints, inverse cosine and cosine will undo each other or cancel each other out, and you just get pi over 3 back. So inverse cosine of cosine of phi pi divided by 3 is actually equal to pi over 3. So this finishes our video on inverse sine and inverse cosine functions and their graphs. We talked about using the inverse sine and inverse cosine functions. We talked about how to find the exact value of expressions involving the inverse sine and inverse cosine functions. And we also talked about the graph of the inverse sine and inverse cosine functions. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions about your work or homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about the other four inverse trigonometric functions and their graphs.